grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning of service today, we are starting a new series called Vanishing Grace. Whatever happened to the good news or bringing good news to a deeply divided world. And that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be throughout this series looking at Jesus and the scriptures and how God comes to his people who are hurting, needing living water and bringing them that good news. But what we also see, and we kind of have a companion book by uh, Philip Yancey based on uh, the same name, Vanishing Grace, where it kind of highlights some of these stories of good news, but also highlights stories where there are those in the world, when they see Christians, they don't get good news, right? There's been all sorts of research that has been done over the last 15 or 20 years uh, from those who are outside of the church, and when they look at you and me, Christians inside of the church, they see, see people who are judgmental, hypocritical, boring, angry, all of these negative connotations that those outside of the church view those inside of the church with. In short, they don't see those who follow Jesus as those who have good news. And so the kind of premise of this is how can we best be, as Miss Abby said, those grace dispensers that bring good news to a very much hurting world that needs this living water. And so I was thinking about that in my own life about how many people, when they look at me as a Christian, they don't see somebody that wants to bring good news. And I realize that because every time I meet somebody new outside of the church, there's one question that I hate to receive. You want to know what that one is? What do you do for a living? Right? Do you guys get that one? If you're like an accountant, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm an accountant. Like, everyone's like, hopefully that's okay. I'm a nurse. I'm a doctor, right? Those are normal, right? When I get that question, guess what I get, get to say? I'm a pastor, and I love being a pastor. I love my job, right? But when I tell people I'm a pastor, I get one of two responses, right? The first response, I get somebody that's way too excited about it right? They almost like start bowing down to me, and then they start complaining about their pastor at their church and everything wrong that he's doing. They're like, now you would never do anything like that, would you? Like trying to pull me onto their side of things, right? That's the one side of things that I get. The second side of things I get when I introduce myself to somebody and they say, well, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm a pastor. Immediately the conversation stops. Immediately, I lose all credibility in the conversation, and they are waiting for me, I don't know, to condemn them to hell, to judge them, to do what it, it stops the conversation. I know I've shared this with many of you before when I was, uh, my wife and I, we bought our first house out in Washington State. I'd been a pastor out there for a year or two, and we were really excited to be moving in, and the neighbors, you know, you show up in like a moving truck, they all kind of arrive and want to meet you, and so we're talking to our neighbors, and our next door neighbor was kind of this multi-generational family that was living there, and they all came out to meet us, the, 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 the grandparents, the parents, and the grandkids, they all kinda were really excited to see who had this big U-Haul truck and was moving in, and write the question to me, you know, like a minute into the conversation, so what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a pastor, and immediately the, the kind of grandfather figure of the family goes, oh, okay, and he looks to my wife, and he says, well, well, what do you do, Amy? And she goes, well, I'm a middle school teacher, and he's like, okay, she might be normal, that's good, and, and he goes, well, where do you teach? And she goes, well, I teach at Peace Lutheran School just down the road, and he goes, isn't that one of those Christian schools? And like all five or six of them immediately turned around and went back into their house. For the next probably two years, they wouldn't wave to us. They wouldn't say hi to us. Like, we'd go down and get our mail at the same time. How's it going? And he just walked back into his house. About a month after we moved in, we decided we were going to do a, a neighborhood kind of barbecue at our house, uh, kind of grill out at our house and invite kind of our, our neighbors to get to know them. And we, we went around to each house and handed out a little invitation to everybody. They didn't answer their door. And on the day of the barbecue, they, they lived in their house. Their garage door opened to our house on the side of their house. And so they could see us all out there. And in their garage, they had made it like a little living room. They had a, a big screen TV and a bunch of sofas in their garage. 
And they sat there with their garage door open, sitting on the sofas, scowling at us the whole time. This has happened to me over and over and over again. And what, what I wonder is my neighbors out there in Washington, what has their negative experience with the church been that has caused that to feel that way towards a Christian or a pastor? Right? When the world looks at us, there are many people who have been hurt by Christians, maybe even been hurt by pastors, who haven't experienced the good news of Jesus through their message. And I'm wondering why that is. I thought a little bit about that, and like I said, I've been kind of reading this kind of companion book to go along with this, and, and it made me think of an old joke. Now, it's a bad joke. Maybe it's a joke that you've heard. It's a joke I think my dad used to tell, so this is like when dad jokes were before they were dad jokes, they were just bad jokes back then, I think, right? But I'm going to tell you this joke, right? But it's not a good joke, so just bear with me, right? But it'll help me make a point here. What do you call a man with no arms and no legs floating in a pool of water? Anybody heard this one? Bob, right? You guys know bad jokes. This is great. Bob, because, right, the rest of you know why? Bob, man with no arms and no legs floating in a pool of water. Why? He's bobbing around, right? Uh, some of you thought that was funny. You knew the joke. Right, I got, I got one more, one more bad joke, right? What do you call a man with no arms and no legs in a pile of leaves? Russell, you, my spirit people are over there. Yes, Russell, right? He's rustling around, right? Oh, funny, right? I told you they were bad jokes, right? But in all seriousness, if you were to meet Bob or Russell, right? A man with no arms and no legs. And let's just say he was laying face down in a pool of water, right? A shallow puddle or pool of water and wasn't able to breathe. And you were walking by him. He has no ability to turn over himself. What would you do? Well, hopefully as a Christian, you'd say, you know what? I want to follow the fifth commandment. You shall not murder, which doesn't mean just not murdering. It means also helping to preserve lives and save lives. And you would get down and what would everybody do? roll him over so that he could breathe, right? Right? What would you think of somebody, though, that, that sees Bob or Russell laying in a pool of water with no arms and no legs, unable to roll himself over, and walk by and goes, oh, Bob, Russell, you're going the wrong way. You know, you're supposed to breathe the air. You need to, you need to turn around. You need to turn, come on, you better turn around. And then just walk away. What would you think of that person? Probably not very good. Some of you maybe see where I'm going with this. Sometimes I think out in the world, rather than joining people in bringing them living water, bringing them good news, dispensing God's good news to them, we get angry and we start yelling at them, right? Oh, you're a sinner! You better turn around, you're going the wrong way. I don't want to touch you, you're, you're a little corrupt, but I'm going to walk by you and yell at you as I go by. Is that very helpful? Probably not. And in fact, that's not what Jesus does. And what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks is looking at these stories in the scriptures where Jesus actually goes and he joins people who need that good news and he dispenses grace. And what we see in our gospel lesson today from John chapter 4, we, we read selections of it because it's a really long section. I'd encourage you today when you go home, read all of John chapter 4. We meet a sinner, right? We meet a Samaritan woman who is a sinner, right? You need to understand some of the background here, right? Samaritans and Jews, they didn't associate with themselves because Samaritans were viewed as kind of like these half-breeds. Historically, they were descendants of people who had kind of been left behind in the Babylonian captivity, and um, so they were left behind kind of in and around Jerusalem. And what they ended up doing is intermarrying with all the other nations around them. So when the Jews came back a generation later from the Babylonian captivity, they had these kind of Samaritans that were there who had intermarried with all these other religions and all these other people. And they said, oh, you guys, right? You guys aren't pure anymore. You've, you've messed up. 
And in Nehemiah and Ezra, when Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall and the temple, they, the Samaritans come and they try to help. They come and cu- try to kind of worship at the temple. And they go, no, you guys can't worship at this temple because you guys are half-breeds. Right? You guys cannot come into the presence of the true God because you guys have intermarried with other nations. So what the Samaritans ended up doing is they, they went, I don't know, a few miles away, and they kind of built their own temple to try to worship God. So Sarah, Samaritans were a cultural class of people who were told by the religious authorities in Jesus' day that there was no way they could worship God. They were half-breeds. They were unclean. And this woman that we, Jesus interacts with is a Samaritan, so she's of that, that kind of culture. And this woman that Jesus interacts with is also a full-blown sinner. We find out that she's committed the big sin, right? The sin of adultery, not just once, but multiple, multiple times. So this woman is a sinner. She's a Samaritan. She has all this shame, and she goes out to a well in the heat of the day, right? When nobody would be going to the well, probably to be alone because she had so much shame with the people around her. She's a sinner that has been told probably her whole life that she's not worthy, that she's never going to be able to worship God. And she meets Jesus. And what does Jesus do to this sinful Samaritan woman? Does he yell at her? They say, ma'am, adulteress, watch out, you better turn around. Does he do that? Right? He goes up to her, and they engage in conversation. And imagine the scandal where this Jewish rabbi is engaging with this very sinful Samaritan woman at the well. He comes up to her and he dispenses grace. He comes up to her and gives her living water. Look at what he says. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. That's the water from the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He comes to her, and he gives her this living water. He comes to her, and he gives her this grace. And then, and then she, right, even brings up the whole controversy about the temple. Right? She brings up, you know, there's this temple that we really can't worship at in Jerusalem. we got this other temple. Like, I don't, I don't even know how to worship God. And look what Jesus says. He says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. In other words, the hour is coming, right? When those lines aren't going to matter. When you're going to be able to come and worship God in spirit and truth. And that hour is now. He invites her to worship the true living God. God. She experiences that grace. And then, right, the woman goes back and tells everybody in the town, right, the woman leaves everything, her jar of water, and went away to the, into the town and says, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Right, she says, this guy, Jesus, he knew all my mess. Right? He knew about all my five husbands. The man I'm with now isn't my husband. He knew all that stuff. He knew all my sin. He knew all my mess. And he came to me and he offered me grace. He came to me and he offered me living water. And word got around the town. Right? Jesus stayed in the town two more days. Jesus got around the town and more and more of these Samaritan people believed and came to worship Jesus in spirit and truth as they experienced a God that was with them and for them, even in the mess of life. I think that's good news. To you and I, right? We live in a messy world. You and I live messy lives that are full of sin. Yet Jesus doesn't come to you, and he, he doesn't yell at you, yeah, watch out! 
right? He doesn't come to you and go, oh, I saw that. But rather, Jesus comes to you with living water. Jesus comes to you with forgiveness and grace as he stretches out his hands on a cross for you where he suffers and dies and is raised to love you and bring you into the fold, to love you and enable you to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the nature of our God. Jesus comes to you and dispenses grace. And as we've experienced this grace and this acceptance and this love of Jesus, we have the privilege of simply loving those around us, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and letting God's grace flow through us. I mentioned that we kind of have this companion book that's going along with this by Philip Yancey that's uh, there in the back. And the book is full of these stories of grace, of, of both biblical stories of Jesus as well as real-life practical examples of people living out grace-filled lives to love their neighbors. And on page 41, Philip Yancey recounts a story of a man named Christopher Hitchens who is a well-known atheist. Apparently, he'd written all these like atheistic-type books, and apparently, Christopher Hitchens ended up uh, getting cancer, diagnosed with cancer late in his life, and was given about a year to live. And Christopher Hitchens recounted his battle with cancer, apparently in an article that I think that was published in Vanity Fair, and what he said was the hardest part about his disease was the Christians. Because the Christians were sending him letters saying that they hoped he enjoyed hell, saying that he was getting what he deserved. And in this article of Vanity Fair, and like I said, this is on page 41 of the book back there as they're kind of describing this, he said, except for one Christian, his doctor, who he describes as one of the greatest living Americans, our most selfless Christian physician, Dr. Collins, who came to him day in and day out, was patient with him, kept talking to him about treatment options, walked with him and kept showing him love. And as Philip Yancey, the author of the book, says... In essence, Dr. Collins showed this man true love and fulfilled what Hebrews 12, 15 says, which says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. He says that this man, because of Dr. Collins, experienced the grace of God. And while there was no deathbed conversion... The doctor made sure that he didn't miss out on the grace of God, and what Yancey says is the rest is in God's hands. We're not called to yell. We're not called to scream. As we experience the grace of God in our life, we are called to go dispense it and love our neighbors as ourselves. So as you experience that grace and that love in your life, right? simply go out and love. Right, and let Jesus handle the rest as his good news comes into the world. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life.